Recently, um, I celebrated a birthday, and uh, my husband, uh, y'all just, I love the Potter's house. Like, you was born. We're so glad you was born. I, I was celebrating my birthday, and my husband, um, he planned like this big surprise thing, and so it was really incredible, and I had no idea what was going on really. You know, um, some men aren't really good at surprises, like totally, but their heart is in the right place. And so I went along with it, and to a certain extent, I didn't know everything that was planned. And so he um, took me out to dinner, and, and then he rented this convertible, which I think was less about my birthday and more about him. It's like they're, you know, like convert. Yeah, sure, okay. So, so we're in the convertible and and we're driving and we're in San Francisco, and and he was like, "Baby, can I take the top down?" And and see, he had to ask because <laughs> you know the way my hair is set up. It's um, my hair is uh. uh flexible, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, you know, sometimes it's like planted like a tree by living waters, and then other times it's removable, and um, it's all right, we're family, I know I'm not judged here, and so he didn't know exactly what was happening in that moment with the hair, and so he knows that the convertible could cause a bit of an issue, and, and you know, I wanted to be sweet, he's planned all of this, and, I, and, and so I go, husband, you know what, you know, just, yeah, sure, we can take the top down, you know, because I wanted to be like his girlfriend, you know, I didn't want to, you know, sometimes you got to be a girlfriend, sometimes you got to be a wife, you know, and I wanted, I wanted to be his girlfriend, you know, yes, let's take the top down, and you know, and I prayed. Because on that particular day, it, my hair was not totally removable because I tacked it down in such a way. That's all right, guys, it's okay. And so he takes the top down. And as long as we were driving in the direction of the wind, things were fine. It was actually perfect because it would hug. But then we got lost and he, he made a U-turn and that's when I learned about headwinds. Because it was real breezy, you know? And for a minute I was enjoying it because the hair, you know, the air was like rushing through my hair and then, and then I realized if the air is rushing through your hair, your hair is not on anymore, so. So that's not good at all, you know? probably be my last time speaking for a while, but that's all right. <laughs> Don't tell Bishop, kill the live stream. So um, I realized that headwinds when you are flying or driving or running or swimming in the direction of the wind, it can be problematic because there's a certain level of resistance when you're in the wind. There's a, a level of resistance. When you're running, you run slower. When you're running against the wind, when you're swimming, it's more difficult. When you're against the wind, literally when you're in a boat and you're, and you're propelling against the wind, it slows you down. It's problematic to be against the wind. The only time that it's not problematic is when you're about to take off. Because there's something about the conflicting winds coming up against one another that one thing has to take off. But there's something about the perception we have to have about the wind and the intentionality we have to have when facing the wind that we realize I'm not running against the wind, I'm not swimming against the wind. I'm covered in such a way that even when wind comes in my direction, all it can do is take me off to another dimension of who I am, to another level of who God has called me to be. I'm not afraid of the wind because I recognize that I can make the wind work in my favor because I have a wind that's stronger than any whirlwind that's going on in my life. And when your wind collides with his whirlwind, something has to happen. 
Something has to happen. Something has to take place. I'm not just in this thing on my own. Have you ever realized what it's like to have backup when you thought you were in something on your own and then you realized out of nowhere that there were people who would be there for you, that God would send people right where you needed them? I thought I was in trouble. I thought that this thing was going to push me back. I thought I was going to take one step forward, then 10 steps backward, but then there was a wind that pushed me and propelled me where I was supposed to be. And so when we find Peter and Cornelius in the text, God is creating these winds. He's creating these winds. It doesn't look like winds, it looks like issues and struggles and problems. It doesn't look like anything good necessarily is going to come out of it, but, but God had a divine plan. But in that moment, no one knew what God was up to. And man, if only we could know. If only we could know. God, what are you going to do with this? It looks like a mess. It looks like I'm losing that child. It looks like the marriage isn't going to come out on the other side. Lord, what are you? It's not that you don't trust him. You just wish you would just, he could just give you a preview. If you could just give me a hint. If you could just give me a hint about what's on the other side of this. Cornelius is a Roman soldier. He's a centurion. He's got honor and respect within the community and he is God-fearing, which sounds like a good thing, but as I was studying, I recognized how difficult it was for him to be God-fearing in Rome at that time. Because at that time, there was idolatry, and the Greek gods played a major role in religion, so this idea of having one God, and certainly the God of Jewish people at that time, seemed a bit like an oxymoron. He was a God-fearing Roman soldier who would learn to live life on a bubble. Because he wasn't quite Roman, because he didn't serve the same gods that the Romans served. But he wasn't quite Jewish because though he served the Jewish God, he could not be accepted into the Jewish faith. But he became comfortable living life on, living life on a bubble. Not quite one thing, but I'm not quite the other either. And he was in an environment that was not conducive to what was in his heart, which I know is not like anyone in the room. I know no one in this room has ever been raised in an environment that wasn't conducive to what God placed in your heart. You've never had to work in an environment that wasn't conducive to what was in your heart. You've never had to be in a marriage that wasn't conducive to what was in your heart. Have you ever had your heart have the passion for one thing, but nothing in your environment celebrated it? People where I'm from don't, we don't go to school. We don't dream beyond a certain height. Have you ever wanted to be something and become something, but not have the support in your environment to really bring that thing out? Cornelius had learned to live life in a Roman environment serving a Jewish God. He was in the world, but not of the world. And as he's really practicing this Jewish faith and he prays at the same times that the Jewish people pray and he serves and he gives alms and he gives his offering, he, something happens that happens to all of us when we begin serving God and that is that his prayers and his offerings become, come up as a memorial towards God. Which sounds like an incredible thing because an angel visits him and tells him that God has seen your work He's seen what you've been doing. He's seen how you stayed loyal, how you stayed committed to what he was doing in your life in spite of the fact that no one supported you, in spite of the fact that you didn't have what everyone else had. And God wants you to know that he saw you and you are on his mind. And then something happens that happens to all of us when we are on God's mind. He has to wait. An angel of the Lord visits Cornelius and tells him that you are on God's mind. He gives him a vision, he says, to send out your soldiers and to send out a servant to go get Peter because Peter is going to tell you what to do. 
But there's this space in between the manifestation of what God said and the time that he says it that is a waiting period that we all find ourselves in. And there's something about that waiting period that determines whether or not we really deserve the thing we've been praying for. You see, Cornelius could have been satisfied just sitting there and and praying and having his own religious routine, but all of a sudden God caused him to want something that he wasn't even praying for. God put something down in his heart that he wasn't even praying for, which would be fine except for once God puts it in your heart, you just can't shake it off. And now you have to wait on God to manifest the thing that you've been praying for that you didn't even know that you should want. The waiting game. The waiting game. I, I, can I be honest? I, the waiting game, it, 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 it bothers me a little bit, okay? I didn't want to say that because we was in church and I know we like to act like God sends a word and we are patient and we have faith and we wait for that thing to be manifest, but there's something about the waiting game that makes me insecure. It makes me question myself. It makes me wonder if I have what it takes to actually lay hold of the thing that I've been praying for. And the first thing God told me as I was praying for Dallas, he told me that somebody in this room was waiting on something. That they were waiting on something. And I said, well, God, what do you want me to tell him? He said, stay stay in that same spot, that same heart posture you had when you first received that word, that same faith, that same excitement that you had. He said, don't let the enemy and your insecurities and the rumors and the opinions start making you think that you need to give up on the thing that I told you. He said, I'm not a man that I should lie. If I said it, it's going to come to pass. And I wish there were a few hundred people in this room who had enough faith to start telling the enemy, you can't have my child. I'm waiting on something. You can't have my tomorrow. I'm waiting on something. I dare you to start looking your insecurities into the face and tell them I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. I know what God told me. I know what God promised me. I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. Devil, you can't have my mind. I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. I wish you would get it so deep down in your spirit that you would start walking around like the thing God told you had already happened because I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something and I'm going to stay hopeful like he told me to. And I'm going to stay praying like he told me to. And faithful like he told me to. And kind and peace and generous like he told me to because I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. God's going to give it to me. God's going to bring it to me. I didn't even want it until God said I could have it. And because he said I could have it, I'm waiting on it. I'm not going to give up. I don't care what the bank account says. I don't care what the bank says. I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. I don't care what statistics say about it. I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on it. 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 Though the vision tarry. Oh, no, I'm waiting on it. I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. I'm coming out on the other side of this. Restoration is a part of my destiny. I'm waiting on something. That child is going to be saved. My marriage is going to be saved. I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on it. I'm not giving up. My faith can't dwindle. You got to tell your fear I'm waiting on something. You got to tell the circumstances I'm waiting on something. And what I'm waiting on, eyes haven't seen. That's why man can't give it to me. That's why you can't give me a word and make me feel better. Because what I'm waiting on can only come from above. I'm waiting on something. I don't have time to rumors. I don't have time for gossip. I'm waiting on something. You're a distraction. I love you. God bless you. Goodbye. But I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. He promised me and I know he's not going to lie. I'm waiting on it. I'm waiting on it. I'm waiting on it. I'm waiting on it. I don't give up on the things God promised me. I'm waiting on something. Because when I look back over my life, I recognize that he has a track record of coming through. And no, he doesn't always come when I want him to, but that usually works out for me anyway, because he ends up right on time. So I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. I'm not giving up.
I'm going to start the business. I'm going to write the book. My children are going to be saved. I'm not dreaming. I'm telling you what God told me. If you would start owning the thing God told you like it had already happened, it would give you every weapon you need when people try to start coming up against you. I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something, and God's going to give it to me. I'm waiting on something. This is a mindset shift. Cornelius is preparing for an impartation of the Holy Spirit, but before God could do it, he had to change his mind. God did not bring you here to find a routine, to find a pattern, and to just wake up each day on autopilot. God said that my ability to move in your life the way that I can move in your life means that your faith needs something to work with. And some of you have given up on dreams and visions for your life because you had to wait on it. And in the process of waiting on it, you felt disqualified for it. And you felt like you weren't going to be able to to handle it, that you weren't capable of praying or having the very thing that you were praying for. But God said, I see something in you that you don't even see in yourself. So what I need you to do is go back to being the kind of person who would put their faith on crazy dreams, that would put their faith on crazy visions, that would dare to start actually believing that no weapon formed against them would prosper. I'm waiting on something. I'm waiting on something. I'm not giving up. I'm waiting on it. I'm waiting on it. And so Cornelius, he's waiting on something. And so the angel of the Lord came to Cornelius and says to send for Peter. And in this time that he's sending for Peter, he has to determine who he can trust with the vision. And so he chooses two soldiers and and a servant, one soldier and two servants, and he says, I want you to go and send for Peter. And in the process of him waiting, it, it dawned on me that he couldn't just choose any servant and any soldier because some people don't know how to handle your vision. You know, one of the problems that most of us have is that we're so excited to have a vision that we let anybody handle the vision. We're so excited to have an idea that we put the idea on Facebook before God can even manage the idea. And then we allow everyone else's infection to get in on our vision until we're afraid of actually pursuing the thing God gave us. God told me to tell you that this is a season where we don't post about it. 